Heart and lungs sound great. Uh, eyes look good. Squeaker works. Caring for wildlife, whether in captivity or out in nature, requires a unique set of skills. That's why wildlife veterinarians like Dr. Oli Alkenbrack are essential to help maintain the health of these animals. Arizona Game and Fish often recruits Dr. Oli, as he's known, when they're working with native wildlife in the field. From wolf health surveys in the White Mountains to Sonoran pronghorn releases in our southern deserts, Dr. Oli and his team make sure these animals get the best possible care. Today, Dr. Oli is at the Barazona Wildlife Park in Williams, where he visits monthly to assist their animal care staff with the medical needs of the wildlife that live there. These are captive, but nevertheless wild animals here. And they deserve the same kind of care that you would expect your dog or cat or horse or cow, sheep, goat, pig to have. So we're here to, to provide them with that same level of care. The first order of business is to relocate two bears to different exhibits. But first they need to be immobilized with just the right amount of sedative. Too much and you could hurt the bear. Not enough and the bear could hurt you. So the goal of wildlife anesthesia is using a drug that's safe for the animal, safe for us, and one that's very potent, so very small doses, result in a good anesthetic event and then something we can reverse. We don't like to leave these animals asleep forever. The first bear has been lured into a holding area so she's easy to access. What we're gonna do is this bear, Dale, is yeah. gonna be transferred to a, another exhibit. And so the staff will get her attention and I'm gonna use this pulse syringe to deliver the drug. Um, even though these bears are captive, they're just as wild as any bear in the world. So all precautions are going to be taken that no one gets hurt and she does well in the process. After the drugs take effect, Dale is weighed and given a quick health assessment to make sure she doesn't have any other issues before being moved to her new enclosure. She's doing great. Uh, you know, she's got a blink reflex still. She's just heavily sedated. The, this combination of sedatives we're using is not necessarily an anesthetic, but just a really potent sedative. Once Dale is safely relocated and recovered from her sedative, it's on to the second bear. This one is out in a large multi-acre drive-through exhibit. And this next bear that we need to mobilize um, Apparently, these two bears have been picking on another bear, so um, we are going to separate the bullies, because bullying isn't even allowed in bears, and uh, we're going to dart these, or, and we're going to dart this um, bear with a, what's known as a Dan Inject system. These darts are air charge darts. They don't have any firing mechanism other than impact, so um, Go to the back and there's a one-way valve that'll keep the air in the dart. You just put as much air in there as you can. And that dart is ready to fire once we put a tailpiece on it. We're gonna stay on this side of the electric fence. When we were over there, a lot of bears were interfering with our work. So we're gonna get, stay on this side of the fence and try to see if we can get a shot this direction. After another successful immobilization, bear number two is safely moved to her new exhibit, where hopefully she'll learn some manners about how to get along with other bears. Animal health is always a priority. It has to be number one, because if we had no animals, there'd be no Arizona. So it's obviously one of the most important things. And, and with animal health, it's one of those things that we always strive to be better. We know that there's things that work really well, but there's always things that we can learn more about and do better on. And so every day we try to always progress and make sure that if there's a new type of vaccine or some type of enrichment that we can give the animals, we try to give that to them.
A good example of this is the type of training the park's jaguar is receiving. So with our jaguar, one of my favorites, his name is Bagheera, he's about four years old, and, and with Bagheera we do husbandry behaviors, so we train them to allow them to participate in their own care, so we reward Bagheera for first touching his nose to a target, and then when he holds his nose on a reward, and so now we're able to start moving Bagheera back and forth so we can examine his body for injuries, teach him to stand up, clip his toenails, open up his mouth, do stand on a scale, right, all behaviors that seem rather simple, but are all the most important ones for their care. Without training these behaviors, we would sometimes have to anesthetize these big animals. And some of the cats, like jaguars, don't always do that great when they're anesthetized. So what's much more safe is just train them to open up their mouths so we can just look at their teeth without having to put them to sleep. There are about 180 animals at Arizona. Some of them come from other accredited zoos or sanctuaries. But the majority are rescues that were confiscated after being taken illegally from the wild or they had become so habituated to humans that they had to be removed. One of my favorites actually, we, we claim 50% rescue, it's actually higher than that. Um, most of our bears are rescue, a lot of rescue critters in the park, we love being able to take those guys in and give them a good home, large areas to move around in. They would have been better off left in the wild, but due to human interference, feeding bears when you shouldn't be feeding bears, uh, picking up baby what you think are orphaned animals and thinking you're doing them some kind of good, you're actually doing a lot of harm. Once these animals get habituated to human life and even imprinted to human life, they cannot be put back out in the wild. They'll never make it. They have no natural instincts. And so these animals are, are destined to a life in captivity. And luckily, you know, places like Arizona have really catered to the to the need for those animals that would otherwise be stuck in small enclosures and small zoos somewhere. Back out in the park, a coos white-tailed deer named Fonzie needs to be immobilized to have his hoofs trimmed, but he's proven to be a challenge to dart. This particular white-tailed deer has a certain aura about him <laughs> that every time we try to do anything to him, he evades us, whether it be running away, missed shots. This is a perfect shot. Hit him right in the rump where it's supposed to do, and we had a dart failure. So um, we'll come back and get him another day. What do you say? It's our only, <laughs> yes, that's, our, that's our only option. That's our only option. Because he's not going to let any vehicle get close to him at all today. Not anymore. The next day, the vet team finally gets their deer. Got him. Well, it's about time. I'll tell you, this deer is a spirit deer. We finally got a dart in him. It only takes a few minutes before Fonzie is fast asleep and can be moved to the triage area. In the wild, deer basically run for a living, so their hoofs wear down naturally. But in captivity, they need an occasional trimming. They also check the young buck for any other medical needs. So once we got this coos whitetail down, we found that it had a um, significant laceration on its left stifle. We're going to do a little wound debridement and get the tissues freshened up and cleaned up and help this wound heal a little bit faster. All right, that wound will heal in about a week to 10 days. We just gave him a drug to wake him back up, so we're just waiting for that drug to take effect. Attaboy! Woo oh, good job. <laughs> oh, Fonzie, no driving for the next eight hours. <laughs> Dr. Ole makes the rounds to check up on several other smaller animals, including a pair of baby otters who were rejected by their mother. They have to be hand-fed five times a day by the very patient animal care staff, but otherwise they appear healthy. I get a great deal of satisfaction working on animals that, you know, are, are extremely challenging. Uh, you know, a domestic animal can't tell you what's wrong. Uh, try applying that same science to wildlife. Arizona is spread out over 160 acres, and visitors can drive through more than three miles of ponderosa pine forest viewing North American animals in natural habitats. 
More animals are exhibited in a 20-acre walkthrough area that's more of a typical zoo-like setting. Educating guests about it, what it's like to live with bears in your yard or javelina, right? How to take the dog food off your back porch so that the animals aren't eating it at night is gonna keep more animals from coming to places like Arizona. And, and don't get me wrong, I love the fact that I get to work with these animals, but what would be even better is if they were all able to live out in the natural environments like they were meant to. What's neat though on top of that is that our environment here for these bears is about as natural as it can get. So it's education because of that is my number one.